So welcome everybody to this week's edition of the Holotube seminar series. We are very happy to have um, Roberto Emperan from Barcelona with us today, uh, telling us about black tsunamis and naked singularities and ADS. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the for the invitation. I'm very glad to to speak at this uh, distinguished uh, series of uh, of seminars. And uh, yeah, you already gave the title of the talk. It's going to be based on uh, work that uh, is this. Okay. So it's uh, based on work that uh, appeared uh, last December in, in archive and it was done with a number of uh, fantastic collaborators. David Licht, who's uh, at Ben Gurion University in Israel, Ryotaku Suzuki, who's now back in, in Japan at the Toyota Technological Institute, Maria Tomasevich, who's a postdoc now at uh, Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and Benson Wei, who still with, uh, he's still with us in, in Barcelona. Okay. So, well, what I'm going to do, I want to tell you a story about uh, horizons and uh, similarities. And uh, I think that you will agree that these are two central concepts in gravitational theory, but uh, they seem to be very different. Horizons are uh, smooth places. And uh, well, one of the things that we've learned in recent times is that they are associated to the emergence of geometry, whereas singularities, they are rough places, and unruly places, which are instead associated to the breakdown of geometry. Perhaps a little more precisely, horizons are limits to what uh, one can observe. They place uh, limits on what, uh, what one can observe, or some, what, what you can causally interact with. And singularities, uh, instead, are limits to what can be predicted. And here, when this talk, when I'm talking about uh, predictability, I'm always going to refer to things that are predictable within the framework of uh, classical general relativity. Okay, so they limit what we can predict using this theory, Einstein's theory. So I say these uh, two concepts, they seem to be uh, very different, but nevertheless, they are linked by the cosmic censorship uh, conjecture or conjectures, because there's actually, actually two versions of them that were formulated by Penrose a number of years ago. So what are these, uh, these conjectures? Well, essentially what they say is that, uh, or what they postulate, what they posit, is that uh, you can predict everything that you can observe. Or if you take the converse of this, you cannot observe what you couldn't predict. The weak version of this, and this is the only one that I'm going to be talking about uh, in this talk today, is the weak version of uh, the cosmic censorship conjecture. It's not that the distinction between weak and strong doesn't mean that one of them implies the other. There's no uh, implication. And one can find uh, instances where one uh, holds and not the other for both equations. But the weak version of the cosmic, weak, uh, cosmic censorship, what it says, is that you can predict everything you can observe, but now we put this uh, qualification that uh, things that we can observe from afar, that's without falling into a black hole, from a safe asymptotic region. A bit more precisely, this uh, weak, censorship, uh, uh, weak cosmic censorship uh, conjecture, where it says that the evolution of configurations that are initially smooth, they remain, the, the evolution remains predictable for observers who are at asymptotic infinity. And in mathematical terms, what we say is that the maximal Cauchy development of uh, smooth initial data possesses a complete scribe plus, a, a complete null infinity. Uh, in lay person terms, what it says is that the naked singularities cannot form. If you start from uh, smooth initial uh, configurations. Now, this is the content, the essential content of this uh, conjecture. And then, well, one of the things that this is limiting, uh, if the conjecture holds what the, it would limit us, is the knowledge that we can obtain uh, about uh, physics at the highest energies, at the shortest uh, possible lengths. Because if naked singularities could form, these are places, and I'm not going to talk about fancy singularities, which are very mild, where the curvature remains finite. I'm going to talk about the uh, really strong singularities, which are the ones that matter most. So if we find a singularity of the curvature, where the curvature uh, diverges, that it can form, 
And then that's a place where we would expect that uh, what the physics that uh, general relativity can handle that uh, would break down it should be replaced by some other physics, presumably something like uh, quantum gravity, but certainly physics at some very uh, short uh, length scales. And that's, as I said, this would be the regime of quantum gravity. If naked singularities could form, then if we could form one, we start with some initial data and we form something that would be described in classical GR as a naked singularity, then this would be an opportunity to learn about the uh, regime of uh, quantum gravity. And then well, what, in this sense, what the conjecture says is that nature likes to hide this Planck scale physics from us, that it doesn't want us uh, to observe this physics, at least if we don't want to jump into inside a black hole. If we want to stay far in our weekly curve uh, asymptotic region, we want to stay there and do physics, and then we shouldn't be able to observe this Planck scale physics. Well, the thing is that uh, this conjecture, as it's stated, we know that it's not true and it can be violated, it doesn't hold. And we have uh, good examples, well attested examples of violations of uh, weak uh, cosmic censorship. I'm going to mention them briefly, you're already familiar with them, but the first one that was as the well attested was the phenomenon of a critical collapse discovered by Matt Chortwick almost uh, 30 years ago, where you start with a spherical cloud of say a scalar field or some other matter, and then you adjust it so that it collapses. In some, for some initial data, this will bounce back, and then the, uh, your cloud of uh, the scalar field will disperse. For some other initial data, it will form a black hole. If you tune them, if you tune this uh, collapse to the moment where you form a, an ever smaller black hole, a black hole whose size goes to zero, then the curvature in this region will, prob up, will, will blow up. And then this will be a singularity that can be observed from, from, the, from a distance. I'm not going to enter into the discussion of whether uh, the fine tuning uh, should be something that rules this out as a physical example. I think it does not, but this is something that if you want, we can comment later at the end of the talk. This is what I take as one good example of a violation of a weak cosmic censorship. The other example, the other well attested example that we have where we don't have to invoke any exotic matter or, or anything. The only thing that we have to invoke is the existence of additional dimensions. That's uh, the example of uh, the evolution of the instability of uh, black strings. This is, if you have a black string, like this one, a uniform black string, it was discovered by Ruth Henry and Ray Laflamme, again, almost 30 years ago, uh, that uh, the evolution, I mean, that this is an unstable object, then the evolution, the full nonlinear evolution of this was followed much later in, uh, with full numerical general relativity in work, impressive work by Louis Lennon and Francis Pretorius, where they showed that in this case you find you find that the horizon pinches and goes on pinching, and uh, it will pinch off in a finite uh, time, and then in this finite time you will form a naked singularity, a region of where the curvature uh, blows up. So then, if we have that uh, cosmic censorship uh, can be violated. Does this mean that nature is kinder to us and that gives us some chance of probing uh, Planck scale physics, of uh, learning about uh, quantum gravity from the uh, safe position of uh, an experimentalist doing this experiment uh, from a distance without jumping into a black hole? So does it give us a chance? It looks like it, it does give us this chance, but then how much of a chance is this one? Or in other words, since the uh, Cosmic censorship conjecture was a conjecture about the predictivity of the classical theory. How much is the loss of classical predictivity? Of course, loss of pre classical predictivity means that you have to you know, learn something about quantum gravity in order to continue. So then, how strong is this loss? Well, in the two examples that I've uh, mentioned, and these are, as I said, the best examples that we have, these uh, violations seem to be very mild, very small. Because here, what you're forming is just a black hole or sort of something that would, it's the limit of a black hole of zero mass. So you have zero mass over there and something that occupies a very, very small space. And it's the same thing, seems to be the same thing in the case of the 
uh, gregor Lafram instability, the black string instability. The, the region where this is going to pinch is going to be very small. It's going to be uh, to involve just a small amount of mass. And then in this sense, these are not very large singularities where a lot of mass gets concentrated and that it occupies a large uh, region in space and time. This seems to be a small event, a very small event. So then this leads one to uh, conjecture that maybe there's an improved version of the cosmic censorship conjecture, of the weak cosmic censorship conjecture, where the loss of predictivity is very limited. So that in practice, at the end of the day, you regain predictivity over the evolution of the system because the loss is so small. It's in fact parametrically small in the limit where your cutoff, your high energy scale or your H bar goes to zero. And then in this limit, you might recover almost complete predictivity. So the idea is that naked singularities may be allowed. This is the this uh, improvement over the weak cosmic censorship uh, conjecture, which, as I said, it's violated. The conjecture here is that you can form naked singularities, but only mild ones. Mild ones in the sense that they are small, they have Planck scale mass, Planck scale size, and the idea is that they will also disappear in a, in a Planck time, uh, by basically evaporating this zero mass uh, black hole, these zero mass singularities. And there's even the chance that it's not only mild, but that the approach to the singularity and the emergence away from the singularity could be controlled by attractors. So in that case, if this is controlled by attractors, then the uh, control, the predictivity of the theory would remain essentially complete. The idea then is that predictivity in the in these situations where we're violating cosmic censorship is lost only for a small time, a time that goes to zero as your cutoff, your Planck length, your uh, quantum effects go to zero. So this is a conjecture, which means that it's something that can be tested, at least theoretically. Okay? Just like the weak cosmic censorship conjecture has been tested and then proven to fail in some cases, in some restricted cases. Can we do something more? And can we interpret, um, I said, well, we have loss or some breakdown of the classical theory. Do we have a quantum gravity theory? Well, actually we do have a quantum gravity theory and all of you here in this uh, talk, uh, you are all of uh, your fans of uh, holography, I assume. So then, well, we have a quantum theory of gravity, which is ads -UFT. It gives us a complete formulation, non perturbative formulation of a quantum theory of gravity at least in some uh, space times with uh, some kind of asymptotics. So what does ads cft say about these examples? So we want to study this phenomena, the context of ads cft but then what we have to do is find a good setup, a good framework where we can do it. So I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, critical collapse. It's something that's been studied. In fact, uh, I will mention it uh, later in work uh, in particular by uh, Paul Chesler and, and Benson Wade by others, but uh, they were doing something similar to what we're going to do. Instead, what we're going to focus is in the other example of our evaluation of cosmic censorship, which was the evolution of the black, black instability. So what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk is on the instability of black strings in ADS. So first thing that we need to do is well to find a black string in ADS. What uh, kind of solution do we take uh, in this case. Well, the solution that we're going to, to consider, the initial solution, the uniform black string that's going to be unstable, is a metric that can be written very simply. You know that, uh, well, if this here take uh, some ADS metric in D minus one dimensions, then this way of writing the, the solution gives you a metric in ADS in one more dimension. But then whatever you have, if you have here some black hole, then this means that it's at that each constant C uh, section, and then you're going to have a black hole. So this geometry, what it actually describes is a uh, Schwarzschild ADS black string. Now in ADS CFT, we're also very interested always in what happens at the boundary. What is the geometry that we have at the boundary? Well, since this black string extends through all values of C, it also reaches the boundary. So what we have is that our boundary geometry consists of two black holes one of them at each antipodal end of the boundary sphere. So we have a sphere with two black holes at antipodal points. And this is going to be a fixed geometry. 
and we're doing just conventional ADS CFT, where the geometry of the boundary is going to be uh, fixed. So I want to study configurations now with different bulk geometries that have the same boundary, where what they have at the boundary is, as I say, two black holes at antipodal points of a sphere. Now, this configuration, this black thing, it was studied already uh, some time ago, the instability, the linear instability of these uh, solutions, it was studied by Peter and Kang, generalizing the analysis of a gregorian Laplace, And they found that uh, if your string is thin enough, then it has the same kind of uh, instability as the gregorian instability, it can ripple, and then it develops small ripples. At the linear order, this is what uh, these people found, that uh, beyond some uh smallness of the radius and then the the solutions become unstable now this was a linearized analysis you want to investigate the full non-linear evolution and see what this evolves into is it going to evolve into something like what uh, Lenner and Pretorius showed or is it going to be something different well in order to find out the first thing that one does is instead of solving the full time evolution typically what one does is analyze possible endpoints static phases, and you want the solution to be end to end in some static configuration. What are the possible static phases that we, we have in this system with two black holes fixed at the boundary? Well, <clears throat> this was studied numerically in a work not uh, too long ago by Don Marlof and George Santos. We have one solution with two black holes at the boundary, which is the one that I just described. We can call it the uniform black string, or sometimes one calls it a uniform black funnel. We can also have another uh, configuration where the uh, horizons are disconnected in the bulk, where you have some horizon here stuck to the boundary, another one at the other end. So they may have the same boundary geometry, but the bulks are different. And these are called black droplets. And then there are, there are other configurations. There are several others, other possibilities, but these are the three main ones that I'm going to be considering, where you have two black holes at the boundary, but then you have that the bulk is filled in by a very large black hole, something that would resemble, say, like a large ADS black hole. Okay? This would be like a large ADS black hole connected to the boundary through two uh, relatively small uh, tubes, black tubes. Now you have the static phases, and then what do you do? Well, next thing that you, do, you can do with these solutions is to study the thermodynamic stability. The thermodynamic stability is not a fully reliable guide. Yes? Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, in the interior geometries, do the singularities reach the boundary? In which? Sorry? In the interior geometry of these objects, uh, the singularities yes. are high. Yes, yes. yes. High yes because there's a black hole at the boundary. So the black hole, the, the black hole geometry of the boundary is singular. So there's a singularity uh, at, the boundary, at the boundary. Yes. So you have in the boundary a black hole with, uh, strictly speaking, zero Newton constant. It's like a. It's like yes. A, I mean, the gravity is not dynamical. It's a fixed background geometry. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's just the Schwarzschild geometry. You put it at the boundary, and that's what you get. So as I said, we want to study thermodynamic stability because it may be a guide to the final end, because we want uh, at least well, entropy not to decrease, or free energy, as we will say in this case, and uh, not to decrease at the long evolution. So I said, <clears throat> in this case, since out our boundaries, we have these black holes, which are fixed, and the, bound, the black holes at the boundary fix also the temperature that you have at infinity. Instead of doing uh, uh, microcanonical analysis, we have to do the canonical analysis where we fix the boundary geometry with the boundary temperature, which means that the area in particular need not uh, be the, our guide. It's going to be the free energy. It's not the entropy, but the free energy. So what does one find? I mean, what did Don and uh, George uh, find uh, for this in this thermodynamical analysis? Well, there's different possibilities. If the black hole is large, and then it's going to be dominated by this phase or by this phase. But that's not the one that we're most interested in. We want the black holes at the boundary, which means that the initial string is thin enough. It's dynamically unstable. When the uh, black hole at the boundary or the initial string is thin enough, then we have two different possible uh, phases that uh, dominate the canonical ensemble. One of them is this one, the uniform solution. This one is never dominant even if the black hole is small. And this one can be dominant for the small black holes at the boundary. So then 
what does this tell us about what does this suggest about the possible endpoints of the instability? Because if we have the dynamical evolution is going to end into something, it could be. Uh, yeah, no. So this one doesn't dominate for small black holes, for small black holes at the boundary. But this one, uh, this one uh, is the, the one that uh, tends to dominate. And this one never dominates. So if this, if we start with a thin enough initial black string, and then I tell you that this is one, this one is going to be thermodynamically dominant, and this is never dominant. If you want to make a bet about uh, where the dynamical evolution is going to go, I think that uh, most people would bet that it should end here. But of course, <coughs> well, I don't want to take bets, uh, but uh, we could try, I mean, I don't know, or polling. But uh, what we're going to see is that the actual situation, the actual evolution can be a bit more complicated than this. So what do we, can we get here? Well, first of all, is it possible that this configuration evolves into this one? Well, here the idea is that this black hole is that the same size as this one. Okay, I mean, it doesn't look the same, but the idea is that it should be the same. Well, one thing that happens in this setup, since your black holes, your horizons extend to the boundary, you don't have an area theorem because you can have horizon generators flowing in or out of the boundary without any limit. That's like saying that uh, your uh, fixed black holes at the boundary, since they are fixed, black holes are hot and they can absorb or emit radiation, and there's no limit to this. You have a question, Pepe. Yeah, this, this black hole yes. doesn't pinch further. I'm going to tell you what uh, what happens. Okay, so that's going to be uh, part of uh, what the story that I, that I want to tell you about. So then, well, we can have flows of generators from the boundary. So then this can grow a horizon that is very large. Energy is not, not conserved within the canonical ensemble. So you can have this thing grow, grow a lot, and grow into one of these fat funnels. You don't have an area theorem. This configuration can have much more or much lower free energy because it has a lot of entropy than this one. So this is something that can happen, and this is what we call the black tsunami flow. You have a wave of generators from the boundary, which can be very large. But then there's also the other possibility, and this is something that the, you can imagine may will happen, because if you have a string, an initial string that's very thin, then near the center of the string, if this string is very thin, this string doesn't notice that it's in ABS. If it's very small, it doesn't notice the curvature radius. It doesn't know it. And then what does a very thin string want to do? Well, a very thin string, what it wants to do is to pinch. Because it's just like in flat space, and in flat space, in a central flat space, thin strings pinch. And they pinch on a time scale that's of the order of their thickness. So the string, it wants to pinch, it goes pinch, and then, well, later it realizes that it's an ABS. But by the time that it realizes that it's an ABS, it's already pinched. So then this is something that looks like a certain possibility that if the string is thin enough, it can pinch, then form a singularity. Then this singularity will be some burst, some eruption. And then that's in this case, when the string is very thin, what you expect to have is an evolution very similar to the one that Lenner and Pretorius observed. So in this case, you would say that this should also be possible. Then this is the, this state, which is not thermodynamically dominant, it may be that the evolution drives you there, and then you end up trapped into something that would be a metastable, not fully thermodynamically stable, but at least dynamically stable configuration. Well, what have we actually found? I'm going to tell you first, and there's going to be a spoiler of the story because I want you to follow the story. Then I will later uh, tell you how we obtain this, these results. So what we have found is that there are different possible, many different possible evolutions, but the main ones are the ones that will be described and describing over here. First of all, so we have these two trends that you can have horizons flowing from the boundary. This is the tsunami flow, or we have the horizon pinching. Whichever happens earlier will win, or at least it will win for a time. So the first possibility is that, well, this is something that doesn't occur so quickly. The tsunami comes, and then you quickly evolve towards this configuration. The other possibility is that this, you're pinching it, and this depends on the thickness and on the initial data, how we kick the, how we perturb the initial steam, can happen that it pinches. Then it forms the singularity. You have a violation then of cosmic censorship. But then afterwards, maybe this pinch it splits 
the operation in two, and then we would end up with two droplets, or maybe what you pinch, but the tsunami is coming. And then this would be more like an actual tsunami, because you know that when a tsunami comes, first you have the wave or the water receding from the shoreline, and then the wave comes and washes everything away. So this would be like the water receding from the, uh, from the shoreline, exhibiting the naked uh, seafloor, and then the tsunami comes, and then what well, it arrived too late. I mean, it couldn't prevent the censorship. Uh, the, the, it couldn't censor the, the, the singularity, but it arrives and then tries to hide it. Okay, so this is what we have found, and this is a description in terms of the bulk theory, the bulk story. What is the boundary story? Well, you can easily guess it. We have black holes. These are black holes surrounded by CFT radiation. The black holes don't, and um, they are fixed backgrounds. You know that when you have a black hole in a fixed background, it can absorb or emit energy. Its mass doesn't change, it doesn't back react. So these black holes begin to can begin to emit Hawking radiation. And the Hawking radiation, what it will do in the case of the this the evolution of the black tsunami, is that you have the, the two black holes are flooding your universe, your spherical universe, with radiation. And then at the end, what we find is this large black hole inside ADS which is large black holes in ADS, you know that they describe dually thermal radiation. So the other possibility is that, well, you have the black hole begins to emit radiation, but before it has flooded the universe, well, you have some burst of radiation. And we're going to see that this is mild. This is, this is the dual of the formation of the naked singularity. Now you have this radiation burst, something that's going to last a very short time. And then, well, the ever radiation the evolution of the horizon, it may grow. If it stabilizes in droplets, then what you're going to find, the droplet corresponds to some black hole with some CFT halo around it. If the tsunami comes, then what you're going to have is that the tsunami will, this will be a tsunami of radiation filling the entire universe. Okay. So this is what we have found. How have we found this? Well, First thing, when we first began thinking about this problem is that, uh, well, it looks like uh, this is a complicated problem because if we have to do the full numerical general relativity evolution of this, this is complicated, it will take a lot of time, it will take expertise on uh, full numerical GR, and this is difficult and costly. Can we find a more efficient or more effective way of doing it? Well, we have that method, and this is something that we've been developing over the years, what we call the large D effective theory, of uh, for black hole evolution, for in particular for instabilities or for black strings uh, and black string evolution in this case. I'm not going to give you the full details of, about the large D effective theories. Uh, I can I mean, that would be a subject for for another talk. I can talk at length about it, but I will give you just a few snippets so that you can follow what we have done. As a warm up, first when we were developing this effective theories for black hole dynamics in the limit of a large number of dimensions. Uh, one of the first problems that uh, we applied this uh, to was precisely the Gregor Laplace problem, the following the nonlinear evolution of black strings in asymptotically flat space, and doing it in this large limit. So if we do it, if we follow the evolution of a black string in the black string stability in, say, in some moderate number of dimensions, then the evolution is uh, like this one. Yeah, no. Sorry. So that's the same kind of, uh, of evolution as uh, Lenner and Pretorius did. And then you form these, these blocks, the cuneiform satellites as well. They are not going to matter for what we're going to say. Now, if we do it using this large D effective theory, this is something that we've done solving these effective equations for black hole evolution when the number of dimensions grows very large. Then in this case, evolution is like this. So it's very similar to what we have here, but you may see, well, this doesn't look like a sphere to me. This looks more like a Gaussian. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that the black holes at large, D, they look more like Gaussian blobs if you look at them in the appropriate way. This is the metric for a sphere. It's just a property of spheres. It's nothing more. There's no gravity involved in this. This is a metric of a sphere written in a particular way in some d dimensions, in d plus one dimensions. You can always write it like this. So you write it in terms of some angle. At each theta, you have a sphere of some size. 
Now, well, what you would get in a low number of dimensions, that's what you get here. But when D grows very large, the area of these spheres, the area as a function of theta, you get this factor of D over here. When you take D to be very large, then this becomes an exponential, which means that the area is very much localized near the equator. If you have a large D sphere, and then you write it, you slice it in spheres of one less dimension, then the spheres in the near the end of the interval have very little area compared with the spheres near the equator. Exponential is smaller. Okay? So this, this is the reason that this black holes over here, here what we're representing is actually the area of these sections of the horizon. This is why they look like uh, Gaussians, but they are actually your good old spherical black hole. Okay? But the idea is that at large D, we're going to represent spherical black holes as these Gaussian blobs. Now, this, this thing that I've shown is something that we did already years ago, the evolution of the black string instability for vacuum asymptotically flat black strings. Now, what we've done is extend this, this, uh, this effective large D uh, theory for uh, ADS black strings. And it was easy to do. We obtained effective equations, which are a generalization of the previous ones. We take the, the equations. These are fairly simple equations. I can show them to you if you want I have uh, some backup slides where I can give you more details if you want uh, about this. Then you take the equations, you find the black strings, the linear or the uniform black string, that's easy. Then you analyze linear instability, you can do it analytically. So that's very easy, you find the linear instability. And then the next thing that you can do is to evolve the equations numerically. You're going to say, well, if I have to do numerical equations, I have to do numerical analysis, then what have I gained? Why don't I do it at uh, finite D? Well, the reason is that evolving the large D equations is something that's extremely simple. Uh, it takes no time with mathematical. And when I say it takes no time, what I mean is that a full evolution takes a fraction of a second. If I want to push it, maybe it will take me just a few seconds. I can do it with mathematical and dissolve. Okay. In the paper, we did better. We had Benson who could do his numerical magic to get results which are more accurate and, and better and under better control. But for many things, these equations are extremely well behaved. It's, uh, you can run them, as I say, I can run uh, the, if I want to run them, it takes longer to write the, to choose the parameters than to have the simulation running. I could do it on the spot if you want. Okay. But I'm going to show you the, the results of uh, what we've uh, obtained in this case. So we've taken one of these black strings in ADS, which is represented in, the, in this coordinate as some cylinder. But the idea is that I mean, we're taking away the asymptotic growth. Uh, that's something that uh, we've subtracted or factored out of the, of the geometry. And then we've obtained precisely the kind of evolutions that I've uh, talked about before. We have the direct tsunami. We have the pinch off with evolution to droplets and the evolution with a delayed tsunami. And these are actually evolution to the black tsunami. And then it grows. I mean, it keeps growing, but then at some point, of course, I'm just close to large, so I'm not uh, dis uh, displaying it. Okay. So this is this evolution. We also have an evolution for this. This is something that tends to two droplets. And we also have the final one, where you've seen we first pinch at the center, and then the tsunami comes and uh, washes everything out. Okay. So that's how we've, uh, we've done it. And that's one of the important results of the paper. We can also, I mean, it's very easy to play with this. You can just change a little parameters, and then we'll get another, another evolution, and then you can get you can get uh, some, uh, some evolutions where sometimes you may form a black hole here at the middle, which may or may not last. So you can form several ripples. You can form not very fat funnels, but maybe moderately overweight funnels, where you have uh, some bulge in the middle, but not uh, a huge uh, bulge. So there's many other possibilities, and this is something that you can easily explore using this large effective theory. But the main outcomes are these ones. And this is the reply to what we said at the beginning. What are the possible evolutions? Can we find violation of cosmic sensors? Because if these were always, and this is something that was kind of a question that was posed in the paper by Marov and Santos, where they studied 
the uh, thermodynamic instability, if this was never dominant, then there could be the possibility that uh, cosmic censorship is never violated. But what we found is that it can be violated. It can be violated in two ways, in a way that survives and that the droplets survived in the end, or in a way that what the, this is washed out by the later tsunami. Yes. Roberto, can I ask a question? Sure. Presumably what you're plotting is the apparent horizon here. Is that right? It's, uh, doesn't, it doesn't make a difference at large. Ah, it's the event horizon and the apparent horizon. They, they are not uh, the because the, qu side. the question I had was whether in the droplet case, which is where you violate cosmic censorship, whether it would be, whether it's completely obvious or out of the question that there isn't an event horizon uh, that actually is hiding the same. Yeah, in this case, you were looking at the apparent horizon. In this case, uh, the apparent horizon, the event horizon, they, they coincide. Actually, this never pinches to zero. You always get, uh, and you can never uh, reduce it to, you can reduce it to exponentially small uh, to zero. So that's one of the things that happened in this Latsley theory. It never actually reveals the singularity. So for knowing the, that uh, you have a singularity, you have to go beyond the Latsley theory. In the case of the Gregor Laplace instability, we see that it pinches, that the pinch doesn't stop. Uh, at, uh, We've included the corrections, and then well, then we have to invoke what we know from fine ID, the Lenard Pretorius uh, simulations, that uh, it will actually uh, pinch off uh, to zero. So we can never actually see the singularity formation. That's something that, as I say, you have to go beyond this theory. But it tells you that you're pinching non-stop, and then what? Well, at some point, the effective theory breaks down, breaks down before you get to the singularity. But uh, what you say is that, uh, well, since you never see it, uh, what you see is a continuous uh, pinch down, exponential pinch down, and then it will, you argue that it will uh, correspond to a singularity. For this, we would need to do, uh, and LATSD is something that I think it's kind of a shortcut to know what to aim for when you do a full numerical GR simulation. Because these simulations, as I say, I can run them, they can run uh, 10 in a minute or more if you press me. But then, so this, this means that we can very easily explore uh, parameters and configurations and then, well, go to full numerical GR and ask, well, can you now try to find this effect? It's something that we did actually. We studied collisions of two of these Gaussian blobs and see what kind of evolutions we could get at large of D. We could see that uh, there were evolutions where uh, the horizon would pinch. Then, when well, we did this at large D, and then later it was verified by Thomas Andrade, Pau Figueres, and Ulis Perhake that if you did the full numerical GR calculation, the results agreed surprisingly well with what the large D theory uh, showed. And in that case, since they were doing fine ID and full numerical GR, well, in that case, there uh, evidence that there's a pinch off, a singular pinch off, was stronger because their methods allowed, I mean, they didn't have the, the same effective theory limitation that the large methods have. There, there are two more questions, Roberto. Uh, first was uh, Pepe and then second place. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah if you, if you want, if you allow. Yeah, no, uh, the, the only thing that I want to say, if you, if you want to, to ask questions, don't uh, raise your hands, raise your voice instead, because I'm not paying much attention to hands raised. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask the, the obvious parameter of the initial state seems to be the ratio between the thickness exactly. central region and the radius of curvature. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's the only parameter, actually. Yes. It's tempting to say that if this is large, you get the direct tsunami, and if it is small, you get the droplets. But then I don't see how do you get the delay, the delays. I mean, this diagram seems too complicated. Like, uh, yes. It's not just uh, larger or smaller than one for this parameter. No? Okay. So I mean, what you're saying is right. The initial parameter, so you have as your control parameter, that's the ratio of the size of the black holes to the, radius, to the radius of the universe, or between the ratio between the thickness of the string to the ADS radius. Now, the other parameter that you have, the other thing that you can control is, uh, well, your initial perturbation. If you have a very thin string, then there are many unstable modes, and the evolution can be quite complicated. 
So depending on which modes you're kicking, you're going to get pinches, you're going to get uh, tsunamis, you're going to get different things. So the evolution is complicated and to find a complicated uh, or a general pattern for uh, answering, that's not, uh, that's not easy because as I say, the, the evolution is much more complicated than we thought. It's true that uh, if your string is just barely unstable, if it's thick enough that there are few unstable modes, then you can easily trigger the tsunami. But you can also trigger the tsunami if you take a different initial perturbation. And this is actually, this, this strings in these two simulations, they have the initial, they are the same initial string, but they are kicked with a different perturbation. In one of them, this is a bit more generic, in, the, in, in, in this one, what we do is we kick it in such a way that, well, we want it to pinch. In a sense, that's a little bit like, I mean, you're saying that I'm fine-tuning conditions. To what extent we have to do fine tuning? That's it, that it's not uh, very clear. But what we know for sure is that we can get the two effects. I think that uh, probably with open open sets of initial conditions would uh, lead you to, to one or the other. It's something that we haven't analyzed in much more detail. For this, we made the string a little thinner so that we, uh, we had one more unstable mode and then we could see that uh, we would uh, probably trigger a pinch and a tsunami, but then, well, you, you want to, the pinch to happen uh, more quickly than the tsunami before the tsunami arrives. And this is something that you can achieve if you make the string, the initial string thin enough. Okay. So that's, uh, I mean, as I said, there's no simple pattern. What you said is basically correct. The thinner the string, the more complicated the evolution can be. I mean, you can have pinching in different places, or uh, maybe some, central black hole forms temporarily and then it's uh, everything is washed out uh, by the tsunami but uh, yeah so this is just a sample of the possible uh, evolutions of the system mm -hmm. okay so bless do you did you have a uh, i wouldn't take question fine okay so this is what refers to well evolution of the horizon and the formation of the singularity now, the next question that we want to try to answer is, well, we have a singularity here, a forming inside ADS. Well, can we say what the CFT tells us about uh, this, uh, how does it uh, signal the appearance of a naked singularity in the bulk? So that's, I think, to me, an obviously interesting question in this context. But then, well, first thing that you see is that at LACSD, this is a very difficult question, and this LACSD is what we were using for this evolution. This is a difficult question to, to answer, essentially because uh, coupling this region where this thing happens in the limit of LACSD, coupling it to the boundary, this is the coupling is non-perturbative in one over d. It's not. This is doesn't does not mean that it's impossible to do it. It's simply that it's difficult to. It's quite difficult to do it. And then I'm not completely sure. It's a very delicate calculation that one has to do. I don't think that uh, the large D uh, approach has been developed uh, at least with sufficient confidence to do it uh, easily. We would. I think it's uh, something that well, we might try to do, but it would take uh, some time to to figure out how to do it properly. But instead, we've changed the tact. We've abandoned large D. We've come to finite D, whatever the number of dimensions we can have this, this instability, and instead uh, use a different approach. The approach is based on an idea that was first uh, examined in a paper by Paul Chesler and Benson Way, where they analyzed uh, singularity formation in ADS in the case of critical collapse. And it's based on a linearized model. And you may say, well, if you're just going to study linearized physics, linearized gravity, well, the formation of the singularity is something that's highly nonlinear. Yes, you're right. But maybe, I mean, part of the propagation from the singular region to the boundary, that's going to be, that can be fairly linear. And maybe there's still some information that we can extract from a linearized gravity analysis. So we're going to propose, or we propose a method. And then, well, one thing that you can try to do once you analyze this singularity formation, in this linearized uh, theory, if you analyze it and then compare it to full non-numerical simulation, fully non-linear numerical simulations, then you can try to compare whether this linearized simplified model, which you cannot fully justify properly, 
there's, as I said, there's some assumptions here that cannot be fully justified. I'm, going, I'm neglecting non-linearities. And then, well, you can try to, to test it, and then when well, the model passes the test with uh, flying colors, actually. So we are going to have to make some assumptions. We want to find a singularity formation in a linearized gravity theory. Then we're going to make the assumption that the singularity forms in a way that's self-similar. And the reason for that uh, we're doing this is that uh, critical collapse, the formation of the singularity, that's famously a self-similar process. The black string formation of the singularity, that's less understood, but there's good evidence that it also shows uh, self-similarity. So that's an assumption in our model, that the, that the singularity forms in a way that's self-similar in time and space, meaning that well, we look at the region that's pinching, we look it at one instant, we look it at another instant, and the only thing that we've done is shrink the region in a proportionate way. Okay, So this means that if we scale the size of the spatial region, then we scale the time and we get the same profile for everything that describes the solution. Now, when we talk about uh, self-similarity, there's two types of self-similarity that one has to distinguish. The one, one of them is the most uh, common one, continuous self-similarity, where this relationship holds for any scaling that we perform, for any value of lambda, any real value of lambda. And the idea is that this is shrinking in this way, at each instant, or you take it as result some instant, you take it at another instant, it's just scaled down by a constant factor. Discrete self-similarity is something that's uh, harder to analyze. It's uh, probably better characterized as something like this, where this property of repeating the solution in a scaled down way, it only happens at discrete intervals. So this only happens when you have that this uh, parameter that you're scaling is uh, some integer times some, some quantity that's called the echo in period in the context of a critical collapse. This is the one that uh, Chopwick uh, found, and this is the one that's going to be most in interesting for us. So we're going to look for singularities in some linear gravity approximation that have this, this structure. What we do is to find a solution to the linear gravity equations in ADS. It's something that we can do because we can solve we can uh, solve the linear gravity equations, decompose them in modes, and then construct some linear superposition of the modes. And then we construct a linear superposition of modes in ADS, a linear superposition that shows discrete self-similarity near the origin at some instant in time. So that's just take linear gravity and the solutions Maybe, I mean, you have to write them in an appropriate way. There's all sorts of things that you have to do. Funny, uh, fancy uh, mathematical analysis of a Jacobi polynomials and other special functions. But then you construct a linear superposition of these modes that shows this behavior that I just showed you. And then once you have this solution that has this behavior near the origin at some instant, then you extract what is the holographic stress tensor. Because we have an explicit metric for this. So then we can extract the holographic stress tensor near the boundary. Sorry, Roberto, what, what yes. are the modes that you use to construct this superposition? Just the uh, ABS modes. I mean, we, we take, uh, we, we solve uh, uh, ABS gravitational equations, gravity modes. If this is what- are, are these normal, um, normal modes or quasi-normal modes or what are these? Normal modes. Ah, so these are the normal modes of uh, vacuum ADS. ADS or vacuum ADS. Yeah, normal modes of vacuum ADS. Spherically symmetric. We want to we impose spherical symmetry, even if that symmetry can be I mean, in, the, in the scaling region that uh, won't matter. But uh, yeah, it's normal modes in ADS. We construct but a linear the... superposition of normal modes with coefficients such that the solution uh, exhibits uh, this, this scaling. I see. So, but the, the situation you're trying to describe is the one where the black string just pinched off. Yes. So, if I were to look at the excitations in that system, what I would find is quasi normal modes, right? Because almost yes. everywhere I have a horizon. Probably so. But then we're assuming that the horizon doesn't, it's an assumption that we don't, uh, we can't really justify that the horizon doesn't play much of a role. That's Even though it's everywhere. 
It's everywhere, but it's shrinking. So we, what the idea is no, that- but it's shrinking, this... sorry. It, it's shrinking only at the pinch of point, but everywhere else it's finite size. Yes. Then, yeah, there's going to be some distortion of the signal because so we have this region that's shrinking. Then we, the idea is that we have the region that's shrinking where you have the horizon that's very nonlinear. We move some distance away from this horizon that's pinching. So gravity in that region should be essentially linearized. And then we expand it. When we go farther, of course, we're going to know that I mean, this is not just empty ADS, that there's some big blobs somewhere over there. We're ignoring those. Now, I guess what I'm confused about is that the normal, nor normal modes don't have an imaginary part, whereas quasi-normal modes have an imaginary part, which is of the same order as the real parts. Yes. So this, this sounds like a big difference between the two. It's some difference, but uh, well, how or why are we confident that, uh, or expect, why do we expect that this is going to give us some uh, sensible results? Well, essentially, the evidence that this works comes from the work of uh, Paul Chesler and Benson, where they studied critical collapse. In that case, it's simpler, it's spherically symmetric. But you know that if you approach critical collapse from the side of the black hole, you also have a horizon. You form a horizon that's very small. But in that case, well, when they studied critical uh, scalar field and they did it numerically, so they had to approach it from one side or the other. They couldn't tune it exactly because numerics doesn't give you anything that's exact. But in that case, even if you approach the singularity from the side where you would form a small black hole, and then you would have that effect of the black hole, then in that case, what they found is that this linearized model, which predicts that the expectation value of the scalar field the dual of the scalar, the operator of the, uh, that's dual to the scalar field that's collapsing. In this case, this expectation value diverges in a way that's inversely linear in time. And this agreed very well with the numerical evolution, either starting from the black hole forming side or the dispersing side. That's everything that we can say. I mean, we don't have any more evidence. So in that sense, our model is not more controlled than this. That's something that we are ready to, to admit. But in that case, I, I can believe this because when the black hole is becoming very small, yes. even if you were to look at quasi normal mode, you would find that the imaginary part is going to zero because the, the absorption is going to zero. But in, the, in your case, you have a black string that is extended everywhere. Yeah, but that happens. But anyway, I don't, don't want to hijack. Uh, we, we can talk about it no. uh, uh, later. <laughs> no, but it's a good point. It's something that I, mean, I don't think that we can do anything else than try to argue that that horizon is also shrinking in a way that resembles very much the way that, uh, well, I mean, it's locally, it's like a very small black hole. It's going to absorb very little. The part, I mean, there's going to be some absorption farther away, but that's far, far from the region where it's pinching. So the idea is that the region where it's pinching, absorption is going to be very small. It's going to be essentially well, um, something that's going to shrink too, too quickly. There may be an effect. That's true. The only way that I know to solve this so far, unless we come up with a, a better example, is to do some numerical evolution. But that's really complicated to approach this region. I mean, if it's already complicated for the spherical symmetric case of a chop pit collapse. For this case, it's even more complicated. So it's not an easy problem. So we're going to just well, try something that seems to work. So are you are you just doing modeling a, an outburst of gravity waves with this particular self similarity symmetry? Yes. Okay. Are you doing it really for gravity waves, or you do it for the scalar? We're, so for a scalar field, this was what uh, Chesler and Way did. What we've done in this paper is for the case of uh, gravitational field, which is, as you can imagine, fairly more complicated. But then, uh, I mean, uh, our collaborators, co-authors in this work, they were. I think that some of them, maybe in this, in this, uh, listen to this, they struggle through. I'm wondering, uh, once, once you have this family of gravity waves uh, with this symmetry. Uh, do you still have many, uh, a lot of freedom? I mean, how many solutions, how many parameters do this family have? Uh, well, I mean, there's things that you can change that wouldn't affect the structure of the singularity because what we're looking is at, uh, I mean, we want to have some similarity very close to the origin and that's what we're interested. Then you can change it away from that. So that's looking at very high frequency modes. Those are essentially fixed. The amplitudes, at least the scaling relation for the amplitudes, that's fixed uniquely. 
then at lower frequencies, you can do whatever you want. And that's essentially what, uh, what we're saying. I mean, you can have some black blob somewhere over there. That's going to distort the final signal, but not much. The peak, what would be something like a peak here, that's dominated by the high frequency end, and that's uniquely determined. Okay, okay. You see here that I mean we aimed to create the singularity at t equals zero. Then the singularity, I mean this signal travels to the boundary in a time that's characteristic ADS time because we were working in linear approximation. For some in the nonlinear theory, this time will be distorted and there will be more, more distortion. But in this model, it's by over two. So this is for the scalar field. But then if you consider a gravitational field, then you have to consider tensor modes, scalar modes, vector modes, everything. All of you holographers know these things very well, that you have that this is a case that's more complicated, but you can do it. Uh, and then what we find, we extract the stress in the tensor. And then this is something that we think it's very robust because some of these conclusions actually follow from stress in the tensor conservation and assumption of uh, discrete self similarity. Then the energy density, in this case, it vanishes. The momentum densities remain constant as t goes to the singularity. And the shear, the pressures would vanish, just like the energy density, but the shear, trace less symmetric component here, they would diverge. So this is the signal that our model predicts for the formation of a naked self-similar singularity in the bulk. This is curious because this, as I say, this is vanishing. This is diverging. What do we make of this? Well, first of all, even if this vanishes, the signal is not smooth because it oscillates an infinite number of times before it reaches t equals pi over 2. So your signal at infinity is oscillating a lot with the very high frequencies, it reaches arbitrarily high frequencies. Okay, But the energy density vanishes as you get to this point. So how are we to think of this say, in terms of dual CFT quanta? What would be the CFT at a large end? What would it see? Well, we think that the interpretation of this result that we have is that, first of all, your energy density is very small. So it's not going to be zero in the finite regulated theory because you form, as you're going to form a Planck size singularity. That Planck size singularity it will then explode. But then, if you have just a few Planck size quanta, then this means that you're going to have a few order one quanta, each one with them, each, each, each of the quanta that uh, reach uh, that are created the boundary, each one of them has an energy that's very large, diverges, diverges like n squared. This is Planck energy density, but this is energy density going to zero, total energy going to zero. Now, the fact that we have shears which are large, well, this means that we're going to have just a few quanta that create large localized shears. That's the gravitons are going to correspond to some shearing at the boundary. Is this something that's uh, mild, strong? How bad is this? Well, I think that the best analogy for this is to think that, uh, well, what would, what would the, the analog say in the electromagnetic case? You have, say that you have gamma rays. Gamma rays oscillate a large number of times. So they produce large dipoles. That's like the large, large shears. So then what we get at the boundary is a few gamma gravitons. The gra gamma gravitons are going to create large shears, but there's just a few of them. And then, well, do you notice the, does any of you notice the gamma rays that are now hitting your body? Raise your hand if you notice them. I don't notice them. I mean, there are gamma rays, I know, a few gamma rays hitting me every, at the, every moment. There are even gamma rays coming from David to me and hitting me across the, the world, but I don't notice them. Okay. So you don't notice them. So this looks like confirmation of this idea that this singularity is very mild. That's what we can say from these from this results. Okay? And there's still work to fully firm up this conclusion, but this seems to go in the direction that uh, this violation of cosmic excesses is something that even the CFT wouldn't almost notice. So, well, I'm coming now to, to my conclusion. What have we learned? From this, well, first of all, is that cosmic censorship it can be violated in the context of ABS black stains, even if there's this possibility of these tsunamis washing out what the 
formation of the singularity, varying forms, and it's just the boundary. The evolution is this complicated, possibly complicated combination of pinch stars and tsunamis. We can, it's just very easy to play with initial data and try to see, oh, this gives me this pinch over here, this pinch over there. The dual interpretation, that's something that's interesting, which is, as we've seen, it tells you about the evolution of well, radiation in a universe where you have two black holes at the boundary. This time, what we've done without back reaction. We mentioned this in a slide, including back reaction. Now we have this final conclusion that then we have a boundary burst, which is shearing, but my, you just have a few gamma and gravitons. And then if we want to take this further, well, I think that something that would be interesting is to see, can we have some dual CFT or quantum mechanical model some, that has some bulk dual that uh, tells us how the singularity So I'm back here. I don't know what happened. Mm. Since there at the end, there's something with the connection over here. Because it went in. So can we include back gravitational back reaction and have the these black holes evolving as they are emitting radiation? This would be something that would describe black hole evaporation as evolution in a classical bulk, classical bulk evolution. And I think that would be interesting. And this is something that we, we think we can get uh, using techniques and uh, modification of the, the techniques that uh, I've described. And uh, well, after all of this darkness and bleakness and everything, I want to end up on a bright, bright point. And uh, thank you also on behalf of my collaborators. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. Uh, sorry, there was some hiccup in the in the connection. I'm not quite sure if you noticed it. I yeah, it was. I mean, I got got. I don't know what uh, whether anyone else was also. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems seems to be okay now. Um, so yeah, let's continue. So first of all, again, thank you very much. Uh, is very interesting and and. Um, um, illustrated talk. Uh, can you, um, yeah, put any questions that you that you have? Hi, Roberto. I I wanted to ask, so I think you, you partly, you, you gave some, some answer already to that question, but how do we, how do we know or how do we gauge whether the large D limit commutes with say small curvature? You mean whether, I mean whether we, at some point, we lose control uh, when we're forming large uh, curvatures, the large yeah. yeah, it does. I mean, it breaks down, yes. So, yeah, that's uh, something that at some point we cannot fully, I mean, within the context or within the remit of the large D theory, we cannot claim that we form the singularity. We cannot analyze the structure of the singularity that forms. For this, we have to go beyond. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't uh, allow you to, to reach the. One can also use a different, uh, taking the large delimit, a uh, different one, but you're taking the large delimit closer to the singularity. And that is something that we've done, at least in some cases, but uh, it's a different, I mean, it's taking it differently from, from this effective theory. The effective theory doesn't, doesn't give you that. What the effective theory tells you is that you're pinching and that you're pinching in a way that seems to go to a singularity, at that point, you have to take evidence or change to some other method to say what kind of, uh, I mean, to, to get more information about the structure of the singularity that you're forming. 
So, what, so what's the, the diagnostic that the effective theory breaks down at large D? That you get uh, that this uh, pinching continues and that the thickness of the of the string over there becomes exponentially small. And that, uh, well, at some point, since we're doing this numerically, at some point, your uh, code uh, just breaks down. Then, well, this is simple diagnostic. We've tested this. One thing that we've done in the case of the asymptotically flat the black strings we did is to include several orders, uh, higher orders in one over D. And then they seem to keep going, I mean, they don't stabilize things. They go to uh, something that, uh, again, looks like a singularity. And the accuracy of uh, the results that you get in this case compared with numerical uh, simulations, it gets better and better by including these one over D corrections. So it does look like, I mean, go, it's going to break down, but uh, yeah, I mean, we cannot, uh, we cannot actually uh, conclude uh, much about the structure of the similarity, simply that it's pinching and that uh, whenever we compare with any system where we can take the large D and compare it with finite D, the agreement seems to be, to be well. So that's, mm -hmm. if you want, it's circumstantial evidence, but to me, I mean, it's, I could bet on this. I'm not a betting man, but at least I wouldn't bet. Uh, but we can, uh, yeah, so do something. I mean, I, I, I believe that is because we've, we've found, uh, whenever we've uh, found that the large D gives us something that uh, would be a singularity, doing any much more closely uh, finite D evolution, it uh, confirms the large D results with, I, I should say, uh, with uh, I mean, the agreement is better than, often better than we could have expected or anticipated. I have a question about your linear treatment. Uh, I know that you said that you cannot fully justify it and, and that's okay, but at the intuitive level, I wanted to ask. Yeah. So given that you form a singularity and that curvatures become very large, I would have expected that there, the nonlinearities of gravity would be important. Yes. Whereas you're using a linear treatment to propagate this out to the boundary. Yes. So is the point that even though this very small region if I go close enough, it's very nonlinear. Yes. Build some region around it where gravity becomes linear, but the subsimilar uh, property still holds. Is that yes. the point? Uh, yes, that's the that's uh, what we what we have in mind when doing this. It seems to be. Uh, I mean, maybe it can be analyzed in more detail. In the case, the one case where the two approaches can be compared is this this work by Chesler and Way. And uh, in that case, this seems to, to, to hold um, that this, 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 this idea that you say, I mean, we're getting some high nonlinear region that's shrinking. But then even that's shrinking in a some similar way, you get away from the fully nonlinear part and then you get into some region where gravity is weaker, but you still have some similarity and this is what propagates out to, out to the boundary. That's what we have in mind. Whether this is actually true or not, we cannot say at present. But uh, what's the time work? scale? Yes. But, uh, sorry, the, maybe this is what's the time scale on which this um, dissipation would happen if these modes were quasi normal as opposed to be normal? Because they, we're talking about an amount of energy that gets dissipated over a certain amount of time, and if that is small, then. Yeah. Then, if the integrated stuff effect over in, over the time scale that is relevant for this is short, then then this it doesn't matter if it's a normal mode or a quasi normal mode. It's not very clear because this is a highly dynamical situation. To what extent? I mean, we're taking these normal modes of AVS, but I don't think it makes sense, or at least it's not clear to me that it would make sense to take a fixed static small uh, AVS black hole and use superpose the quasi-normal modes of this uh, fixed static uh, black hole because the black hole is shrinking. So it's a highly dynamical situation. I don't know how to improve this uh, model in a sensible way, in such a way to uh, take into account this, well, 
these effects. Maybe one can do it in some parametric way. I don't know. I mean that uh, you're taking the size of the black holes also to, to shrink to zero, but that I'm not sure that that would be uh, very accurate. And then also one thing that uh, this model has is that everything is uh, very explicit and analytic. If you begin to do uh, more complicated uh, things, to complicate the thing with I mean, gravitational quasi-normal modes of some Schwarzschild black hole, that's in general something that uh, well we know it analytically. No, we don't know it analytically. We know it numerically, and then you lose quite a lot of uh, power uh, from this from this construction. So I think that the model is is good. It's I mean, it gives us an explicit geometry, so we can do other things with it. So I've told you, for instance, about the signal in the one point functions of the theory. You may want to use other observables, not one point functions. The one point function at the end of the day is not so sensitive. The one point function, the one point function of the stress tensor is something that you measure. I pros very aggregate things, not so close to the singularity. You may want to use other pros, which are, I mean, say a two point function between points that are opposed on the sphere. So that would be modeled by something like a geodesic running between antipodal points of, of ABS. So it will go to, uh, close to the center. So this two point function would be more sensitive to the, to the singularity. And since we have an explicit metric, well, we can try to see what uh, this would give. I mean, a two-point function or some Wilson line or some other operator that's uh, more non-local, something that's not just like this. Two point, one point function is, is probably is the simplest thing that you can do, but maybe it's too crude. The one-point function, by the way, it wouldn't be sensitive at all to a continuously self-similar sing, uh, singularity. That's something that one can argue easily. Higher point functions would be sensitive, but uh, if you have continuous self similarity, that doesn't show up in the one point functions. So there's more to do. And I think that this linear model is simple enough, it seems to be working well enough. And uh, I think that one can exploit it more. Any more questions? One final question, yeah, uh, or a lift on, on my side. Um, just, just to put it in a, in a broader context, maybe. So one of the reasons we want to do ABS CFT is because we want to use the CFT to answer in a non-singular way questions that we don't know the answer to in the bulk, like this singularity yes. dynamics. But here you find that uh, both the bulk is singular because the curvature blows up and at the in the CFT, you find a divergent. Uh, I think that diverges with n. Ah, so you think it's a it's a large chain effect that. Yes. Um, no, but it it diverges with n, but um, no, you had a one over t minus pi over two. So yes. the, there's a factor of n that so the n squared, everything in the gauge series is always in order n squared. But you have a divergence at a particular time. It goes like one over t minus pi over yeah, minus, minus some, so yeah. So yeah, when this so, difference is Planck size, that's uh, when well, you, your theory breaks down and then you have to replace it. What break? But at the CFT, why is something breaking down? Well, it, actually, I mean, in the in the case of uh, this. It's not clear how much is breaking down because the energy density doesn't blow up. No, but the, some some components of the stress some tension. Some components of the stress tension. Yes, yes. So when this is of a Planck size. But what 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 do you mean by Planck size? In the bulk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, but at the boundary, I have a yes, yes, no gravity. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So oh, when this distance is of order. When this uh, this difference is for the one over n square, I think that's uh, when you want ah, to get. Hmm? Sorry, I say that the when, is done in the back, not in the boundary. Yes, no, but the, this this is at the boundary. Now I'm talking the boundary. No, but so, uh, but uh, the computation breaks down when the time gets Planckian because yes, it's really do the computation in Jamie's theory. You did it uh, to. Yes. Bologna. Yes, but then what I'm saying is if, if I do it in the Young theory, there's going to be some time 
when this there's going to be some some uh, some moment when some uh, operators are going to acquire large expectation values of order n squared and then this will happen when this t minus pi over 2 at the boundary when this this quantity is of the order of 1 over n squared so that this expectation value is going to be of the order n squared And your theory, I mean, you're, you're letting your gauge theory uh, or your quantum mechanical theory evolve. Then you reach in a, you're approaching a point, something that happens in a way that, I mean, what we're getting here is a prediction of how the gauge theory is going to approach that, uh, that moment. So when you're close at some point, at some time that you extrapolate to be, say, pi over two, then when t is close to pi over two by a number of order I mean, the difference between the two is one over n squared then your shear the expectation value of the shear is going to grow like n squared actually roberto this this just shows me that i missed an important point why isn't all why aren't all the stress tensor components for any time of other n squared given that they go as one of a g newton in the bulk well the way that's that's a well, n squared. I mean, here we're, we're not getting the. Uh, you, you're the maybe end. subtracting the vacuum value or something. Yeah, yeah, that's. No, but, but the difference should still be order n squared, shouldn't it? Because you're getting the stress tensor from a pulse. Yes. Of scalar field or gravitational yes. field in the bulk. And that yes. always carries, a, you know, the dual stress tensor always has a one over g newton if you want, which is. G newton in the bulk, which is okay. Square. Okay, very good. So that so then you're saying that this should have an amplitude that goes like n square. Yes, for any time. Now I'm telling you that when this is of order one over n square, I mean when this and then this is going to be of order one. The total energy density is going to be of order one. So you're going to get of the of an, a number of quanta which is going to be order one, not order n square. Okay. So this is going to go like one over n squared. Now you have another n squared overall factor that makes this order one at the end of the day. Yes. But then the the, the that's okay. That's okay. Yes. So but then the what, here, okay. that we're, we're, what we're getting is uh, order one quanta. Yes. A few gamma, the, gamma gravitons. So the shear will diverge as n to the fourth then. Uh, yeah, in that sense, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I didn't say that uh, correctly. Yeah, it's super like, uh, yeah, yeah. That's because yeah, in this in this uh, limit, uh, yeah. So yeah, the, the the reason that you have these relationships over here, if you tell me that the shear goes like this then there's an argument that's based just on energy and stress energy conservation that the time derivatives of this are related to the value of this so all of this is dictating how these things are going to so this is just like saying that if you have one gamma ray which uh, with with frequency n square then the shear or the dipole uh, the dipole rate the dipole uh, Sheer rate, or uh, I don't know how, how it's called, then that's going to be of the order n squared. And you just you just have one quantum, but oscillating very rapidly. So the shear is measuring the dipole rate, and that's going to be n squared. So now we have here one quantum or one graviton, one graviton oscillating uh, very, very quickly, and it's going to give you a large shear. But that's just one graviton oscillating very quickly. It gives large shear, which is localized, but not more than that. The shearing rate is large, but the energy that's uh, carried it's small. That's just very general, as I say. That's just stationary conservation. Once that you have, you have that the. Uh, Shear goes like this, or that the energy density goes like this. The rest just follow from, from conservation, essentially. Can I ask last one? But maybe not. But not much. Sure. Yeah, we have time for one more official question, and then we can can uh, switch off the recording. 
I, I have to go anyway, so I, I will ask it now. So uh, let's describe this as mild, okay? I think this is what you said, as mild okay. response, okay? Yes, yes. But uh, already in the beginning of the talk, when you were describing the bulk pictures, you were saying that these are mild singularities. You, you use this, uh, these yes. these because you were saying that they affect the small distances and the small scales yes. of time in the bulk. Yes. So the question is, uh, are there uh, non-mild uh, singularities which uh, can be embedded in ideas which are not the space-like ones, the ones that you get in the future? We don't know. We don't know of any. And I would like to, to know of uh, such... No, we don't know of any. Uh, so the, the question was that. Uh, okay. of any uh, or at least, I mean, of... Uh, this, I mean, I could elaborate uh, uh, a little more, but I don't think that we have. And there's an example of a violation of uh, cosmic censorship in ADS that Horowitz, uh, Santos, and Wei uh, described. But I think that that can must be treated uh, separately. I mean, I could go on uh, more about this. I have to say that the, the, the this conclusion from this analysis that uh, and that what we can say from here is that the singularity is mild that's something that i like to emphasize but maybe some of my collaborators wouldn't emphasize it so much mm -hmm. but i like to emphasize this because uh, i think it's it's the right conclusion or at least it ties in with uh, other ideas that uh, that we've seen yeah Okay, maybe that's just a good time to finish the recording and thank Roberto once again for the nice talk. Thanks everyone for the lively discussion. Um, and glad to see you again. And um, with that, we end the, the, the recording. Thank you very much. See you next week. <laughs>